Good afternoon, everyone. I think we got people piling in. I see them coming, 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 march on in. Uh, we are here today with Miss Shanna Welsh Levin. Hi, everybody. I am going to give just a couple seconds. I think we are just about there. Um, you guys are obviously here on the uh, rental cap and um, eviction moratorium. Uh, the widely viewed video that she uh, recorded earlier for us in a, in a different webinar. But I'll tell you, uh, she is not only an expert real estate attorney, but she is my friend and I'm glad to say that. <laughs> um, we've had the opportunity to serve side by side, even in volunteerism. She is a uh, licensed real estate broker as well and uh, active member of SDAR. And so uh, that's the kind of benefit and the kind of quality skill set of people that we have that, um, you know, serve under um, this organization. Uh, Shanna is with SoCal Realty Law. If you have not seen that, she is a partner and a corporate lawyer there. I think you've been in business, so uh, what, eight, nine uh, since 2011, yeah, but I've been an attorney uh, since 2004. Right, so long, long, long time, long time, and she's got a really good, amazing track record. Uh, anybody in real estate who knows anything about short sales will definitely know SB 931, and that was the legislation that made it where we could go out and tell people, okay, let's do the short sale, you won't get 1099. And this is the lady who was partly responsible for that legislation. So she's been around, she knows what she's doing. Um, she's worked with Senator um, Denise, is it DeShaney? DeShaney, DeShaney. Mm -hmm. That's who that so. was on that particular bill, right? Right. And then uh, of course she does hold a degree as a Juris Doctorate, Doctor from California Western School of Law. Um, graduated magna cum laude, what would you expect, right? Nothing any different <laughs> from the University of Pittsburgh. In, in um, music. In music. <laughs> but, but, but it is, but all your services too. And I'll tell you, um, with just that wide variety of a skill set, I do want to point out that she's actually served in leadership capacity here at SDAR on our committees as well. And so I, I think that's very well rounded. She gives back, um, but she is definitely trending out here. And um, the one you really, really want to talk to because these ordinances are very, very serious and there's some very fine lines to walk. And so with that being said, I'll introduce to you happily, uh, Shannon Welsh Levin. Thank you so much, Carla. What a great introduction. I really appreciate you. And I'm so grateful to have you as my friend and also my colleague. And you're, you're a wonderful broker. I know you work really hard. Carla works so hard for her clients and is always finding the difficult ones and the ones that just, they find yeah, me. Uh, you hang in there and you, you are such a great uh, provider for your clients. So uh, I appreciate you very much. And I appreciate SDAR for asking me to present this um, to the membership and to others who are attending because it is very sudden and it's very important that we at least know what's out there and know when in particular when you can handle a situation on your own as a realtor or as a non-attorney and when you do need to find an attorney who understands what's going on um, you know at socal realty law we are real estate attorneys and we protect real estate investors and real estate professionals so in 2020, uh, April 2020, I started doing these landlords need to know webinars just to get the information out there and make sure that we could be a resource for not only, only our clients, but our community. Uh, and so we've kept up to date on all of these new laws. Um, let me share my, my screen so that you can see my slides because then you don't have to watch me the whole time. Oops, and I need to move back a couple slides because we're way at the middle. Okay, so that's me. Um, and, and, you know, we today we are working on, we're talking about navigating the County of San Diego eviction moratorium. This review is particularly geared toward the San Diego Association of Realtors. Um, as Carla said, I am a realtor. I've served on the committees. I understand a lot of the issues that are out there. I talk to realtors all the time and really try to stay up to date on what's going on, not only with landlords for these laws, but also with realtors. Um, and 
today is a very appropriate day for us to be having this webinar because it is actually the very first day that this County of San Diego eviction moratorium goes into effect. It was passed in May and now it is in effect until 60 days after the stay at home and work at home orders are lifted by the state of California, but it only applies to the County of San Diego. The ordinance is pretty extreme, um, but it's also short lived. The, but the, the danger that's behind it is that even though the eviction moratorium, this ordinance will be short lived, its effect on landlords liability and potentially lawsuits against, li against landlords by tenants could be very extended. Um, you know, those, those kinds of liabilities and lawsuits could go on and on. In the last couple of weeks, I've attended other webinars given by my colleagues on this topic. I've collected as much information as I can and as many viewpoints as I can. Um, but today's webinar is not intended as legal advice for any specific situation or in general, it's not legal advice, but only legal opinion and observation of the current status of the of evictions and current status of the law. So the new ordinance, it's important to understand that it's not an extension of the California eviction moratorium. That California eviction moratorium is still in place and through June 30th will still be in place uh, and potentially may be extended. But this San Diego County ordinance is very much a separate new law that sits above the California moratorium laws uh, and it is more restrictive. So it really uh, just adds on or uh, narrows the law for San Diego County only. We will also review some of the status updates on COVID-19 Tenant Protection Act of 2020, which I used to call our roadmap through the end of the California eviction moratorium. Um, and we'll also talk about the federal eviction moratorium a little bit under the Center for Disease Control. And we'll talk a little bit about relief for landlords, particularly the federal and state relief funds that are available for um, rental assistance. The laws that we discuss today are relate primarily to residential properties. They relate entirely to residential tenancies to the extent that somebody might be residing in a non-residential property, this could apply to them. But uh, the way that the law is drafted, it's for residential properties. Okay, so deadlines and extensions of the California eviction moratorium. We'll start here just to say that in January, pursuant to SB 91, the California lawmakers extended the COVID-19 Tenant Protection Act of 2020 through June 30th, 2021. And that act restricted residential evictions for non-payment of rent and other COVID-related hardships protecting tenants from eviction by requiring just cause for every residential eviction throughout California. We're holding our breath to see if that gets extended further. I know there is pending legislation already proposing to extend it through December 31st, 2021. We just don't know yet if that's going to happen. And these things tend to happen at the last minute. So keep an eye out for that at the end of this month. The COVID law's impact on the direction of residential evictions will continue to affect landlord-tenant relationships through the end of 2025 as it's drafted, uh, but its most immediate and biggest impact is for tenancies that existed from March 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Interestingly, the San Diego County Ordinance is retroactive through the, um, the start of the local, uh, local emergency related to COVID, which was actually declared on February 14th, 2020. So the San Diego ordinance is actually backdated even further than the current California eviction moratorium. A lot of folks are waiting for the California eviction moratorium restrictions to expire so that we could move forward with residential evictions based on non-payment of rent, other financial obligations under leases, as well as subleasing. But with the new San Diego County ordinance, we will be waiting a little bit longer. And we'll see if there are further extensions of the California laws. 
So we'll go through the high points of the San Diego County eviction ordinance. Um, it only affects, as I said, residential properties or any place where an individual is dwelling. Uh, so if an individual is you know, sleeping in their commercial space, potentially, actually they are protected because of the policy of keeping people in place. Um, as I said, it begins June 3rd, that's today, and it will be effective until 60 days after all work at home and stay at home orders are lifted by the state of California. The, and um, you know, it actually it applies at any time that a local emergency is also declared. So if San Diego does not lift our local emergency at the same time as the state, it may continue until the, the city or county the local emergency is also lifted. Um, limits, it limits the evictions to only two kinds of evictions, SB 91 non-payment of rent evictions and eviction of tenants who are an imminent health or safety threat to other tenants or occupants of the same property. I'm gonna talk more specifically about those kinds of evictions in a minute. Um, the, as I said, it dates back to February 14th, 2020. And the justification as written into this ordinance goes on and on and on. Um, it is very well justified if you read the reasoning behind it. In particular, COVID-19 is the main reason, but the disparate impact of COVID-19 and of evictions on certain populations is a big factor. Also, the fact that people will self-evict when they are in fear of being evicted or in fear of of being sued. And so the, the county wanted to just put that to rest that people can't, uh, can't even be touched during this ordinance unless they fall under the very narrow just cause. And it's also supported by the severe housing affordability crisis in San Diego County. Um, next, section three of the ordinance, if you have a copy of it, and I, you know, we could certainly disseminate a copy of the ordinance if you care to read it. Section three is the meat of the ordinance where it states that in the absence of the just cause as defined in there, no landlord may do any of the following. They may not lawfully terminate a tenancy. They are prohibited from serving notices of termination of tenancy unless it, they can comply with the narrow just cause requirements and the new formatting requirements that are required. Um, landlords cannot file or serve unlawful detainer suits or an ejectment action, which is kind of an alternative to an unlawful detainer. Um, for instance, for removing an owner from a property, if there's reason to remove an owner, you do an ejectment action or other actions to recover possession of the premises. The landlords are prevented from even seeking an eviction or causing or permitting a writ of possession to be executed, even for judgments entered prior to the ordinance. This is troubling for me personally because I performed a, a jury trial. I, you know, we went through a whole jury trial for a client in April. We were the fourth civil jury trial in San Diego County and we won, and so we got the judgment, the judge signed the judgment, the judgment went through the process, we got a writ of possession, we sent sheriff's instructions to the sheriff's department, and the sheriff has posted a notice to vacate for the tenant, but the lockout hasn't actually happened yet. The way that this is drafted, um, the, the strictest interpretation, the most conservative interpretation is that we should now withdraw the writ just in case the sheriff happens to execute the writ without our knowledge. Um, and usually they'll give us a phone call and let us know when they're going out there. And as long as we get that phone call, we could tell them to hold off. But the fact that they even pick up the phone and make a phone call that they're ready could be an action in violation of the ordinance. It's very, uh, very broadly written and very poorly written so that it's hard to know what you can and cannot do, what's okay and what's gonna get a landlord sued for a violation. A landlord cannot take any other action in reliance on a notice of termination of tenancy and all notices served or expiring since February 14th, 2020, that's when the local emergency was enacted, 
uh, quote, shall be deemed invalid and insufficient to support an action in unlawful detainer. So if you've served any notices uh, prior to now, after February 14, 2020, even if those notices have gone to judgment in an eviction case, arguably those notices are no longer valid. Uh, and any pending notices are certainly no longer valid and cannot support any evictions. Is this constitutional? The retroactive, uh, uh, the retroactive effect of this, is it constitutional? Well, our um, Southern California Rental Housing Association has already filed a federal lawsuit against the San Diego County Board of Supervisors to attempt to stop, first of all, to attempt to stop this from, uh, ordinance from going into effect. That effort was denied in the federal court. The judge denied a request for a temporary restraining order or an injunction to stop it from going into effect. And um, we'll see if they are able to determine this ordinance to be unconstitutional. But the fact that it's in effect now really means that the, the harm has already begun. Um, and so a landlord finally cannot represent to a tenant that the tenant is required to move out. This is so broad that it actually restricts a landlord from potentially even negotiating a move out date, potentially even suggesting that the tenant might move out. I, I thought that it was a good suggestion that a landlord might give a tenant a letter saying, you know, we would really like you to move out because we're really having a hardship and we want to sell the property. We want to get it on the market by June 30th. And could you please just move out and we'll offer you some cash for keys. But unfortunately, the way that this is written is so broad that even that could be interpreted by a tenant to be an inducement to vacate. Uh, and it really comes down to the tenant's subjective interpretation of what the landlord is saying as to whether or not the tenant is, or whether or not the landlord is violating the or ordinance. So uh, more highlights, um, the ordinance requires certain language to be included in any notice that is going to be valid under the, the ordinance. This language has to be in bold underlined text in 12 point font that quote, the emergency eviction moratorium is currently in effect. Other than for failure to pay rent or an imminent health or safety threat, evictions are restricted during the local emergency declared by the County of San Diego. Tenants who are being evicted for failure to pay rent may have additional protections under California law. You may contact the Legal Aid Society of San Diego or the Legal Referral and Information Service of San Diego, um, of San Diego County Bar and the contact information is provided. Um, the notice must also include a specific reason for the eviction. And if the landlord communicates to the tenant in any other language, the notice must be provided in that language that is used. So if they communicate in both English and Spanish, the notice has to be provided in English and Spanish. The one bright point is that the San Diego ordinance does not relieve a tenant from the obligation to pay rent and it does not restrict a landlord's ability to recover rent. So as far as rent is concerned, the rent is still accruing, the tenant still has to pay, and eventually the tenant may be able to be evicted for non-payment of rent. More highlights. Um, section four of the ordinance includes a moratorium on residential rent increases from June 3rd 2021 through July 1, 2021. I have another slide. We'll go through the specifics on that moratorium. It's very short, less than a month, um, but it's also very restrictive. Section five of the ordinance forbids any waiver of the rights under the ordinance by the tenant, uh, whether it's by a stipulated agreement, a settlement agreement, a lease agreement, or any other type of waiver, it's invalid. Uh, uh, all tenants are protected. Um, section six of the ordinance forbids any retaliatory conduct against tenants who disseminate this information. And then section seven provides remedies to tenants against landlords who violate the ordinance. 
the section seven requires strict compliance with the ordinance, meaning word for word compliance. Every detail must be complied with in order to support an eviction. And if the landlord fails to comply strictly, the tenant may file a lawsuit against the landlord for injunctive relief, which is where you're asking a court order to stop the landlord from doing whatever they're doing, whether it's an eviction lawsuit or some other action that the landlord is taking to induce the tenant to move out or to increase the rent or you know anything in violation. Tenants would be entitled to money damages, mental or emotional distress damages, and even treble damages, treble, punitive damages, for any knowing or reckless violation of the ordinance, knowing violation. So if you know the ordinance exists and you violate it, then that tenant may get treble damages for their mental or emotional distress due to the violation. It could include attorney's fees if the lease provides for an attorney's fees provision. The remedies include a declaration that if the tenant proves that the landlord has violated the ordinance, the tenant is the prevailing party in the lawsuit. Prevailing party is a term that's used to trigger attorney's fees in most contracts. Most contracts say the prevailing party in, in any lawsuit arising from this contract shall be entitled to their attorney's fees. So if your lease includes that, then you may be liable for the tenant's attorney's fees for any violation. Not just a knowing or reckless violation, but any violation. Okay, so um, no notices to terminate the tenancy. I put this in big, bold language because um, I get a lot of questions about, well, even though this ordinance is going on, can't I still serve a notice for non-payment of rent? Can't I still serve a notice uh, to terminate the tenancy for any valid reason that was valid prior to the ordinance? The answer is no. The only termination of tenancy notices that can be served would be for those reasons authorized by the San Diego County Ordinance. And they have to include the new language in bold underlined 12 point font. Um, so that means that the CAR notices are no longer compliant with San Diego County, within San Diego County, unless you add language to them. I recommend that you do not add language to them, but rather if you think you have a valid basis for an eviction under the San Diego County Ordinance, talk to a legal professional who knows what's going on. Talk to an attorney first who is familiar with the ordinance and can advise you whether or not you can move forward and then make them use their forms. Don't serve any notices of termination of tenancy yourself from June 3rd today until this ordinance goes away. Even then, uh, prior to this ordinance going into effect, the 2019 and 2020 Tenant Protection Acts have very onerous notice requirements in order to move forward with an eviction. So for any kind of non-payment or breach of lease eviction, a 15-day notice, which used to be a three-day notice, is now a 15-day notice, you have to include the notice from the state of California, which advises the tenant of their right to pay 25% of the rent due during this transitional time period, um, September 2020 through today, uh, on or before June 30th, 2021, in order to be protected from eviction. So the, the state of California requires you to inform the tenants that they can pay that 25%. Um, and even if they don't pay the 25%, it informs them that so long as they submit the declaration to the landlord or to the court, they may be protected. And then uh, come July 1, we may or might uh, be able to proceed with an eviction if if the 2020 act is not further extended. Um, then there's the California declaration that also has to be served with the 15 day notices, uh, which is a statement that the tenant simply has to sign and deliver back to the landlord or to the court stating their COVID hardship. And then any 30 or 60 day notices that we were using prior to this ordinance going into effect also would require relocation assistance or other kinds of compliance pursuant to the 2019 Tenant Protection Act, uh, particularly for properties that are not exempt from those just cause and rent cap eviction laws. Other notices may also be required. So for residential evictions, um, 
they must only be for cause. And this is a list of the laws that we now have to look at in order to determine on a case by case basis how we can could or might not be able to proceed with an eviction. Uh, so we keep these on hand at all times. I won't bore you with all the numbers, but it's it's a lot. It's a multi-layered situation where you have to kind of peel back the layers. Okay. So the San Diego County Ordinance in particular really ties our hands temporarily and we suspect it may expire as early as August 14th of this year uh, if the stay at home and work at home orders are lifted both locally and statewide by June 15th. So under the San Diego County Ordinance, these are the reasons that we now can evict. It doesn't look that much different than this slide prior to the, the ordinance, but I will get a little deeper into it in the next slides. In particular, if unlawful detainer was established before February 14th, 2020, it used to say March 1st, but now the local ordinance goes back to February 14th. If the notice is expired prior to that date and an eviction still hasn't been filed, it may be able to be filed today, but um, there's a, there, there are some issues there with regard to waiting that long. Second, any new notice demanding pay, payment of COVID-19 rental debt as defined in, this, in the COVID-19 Tenant Protection Act could be issued to a tenant that failed to comply with the requirements of CCP 1179.3. That is where the landlord has served the declaration and the notice to the tenant and the tenant has failed to return the COVID hardship declaration to the landlord or to the court, as well as the fact that the tenant has failed to pay the 25%. So if a tenant has not paid the 25% of their COVID-19 rental debt, that means the rent that's due from the beginning of COVID through June 30th, and they fail to submit the declaration, then uh, you may be able to proceed with an eviction against them. Um, and then if the unlawful detainer arises because of termination of a tenancy, oh, by the way, that, that, that bullet point, you may be able to proceed with an eviction against them as of June 1, I'm sorry, as of July 1. So at the end of this month, July 1 hits, you may be able to proceed with evictions under that second bullet point. The third bullet point is when an unlawful detainer arises because of termination of a tenancy based on an at-fault just cause or no fault just cause as defined by the San Diego County Ordinance. It used to be as defined by certain definitions that were a, a bit broader and now we're very narrow. Under the San Diego County Ordinance, the at fault just cause definition is that the tenant is a hazard to the health or safety of other tenants or occupants of the same property. It's also if the tenant has defaulted in the payment of rent failed to pay 25% of that rent on or before June 30th and has not delivered the COVID hardship declaration. So this falls into certain boxes. Um, if an eviction, if a tenant is a health or safety threat, the eviction could be based on nuisance or waste. The eviction could be based on criminal activity. It could be based on the tenant's refusal to allow entry if, you know, the landlord has to get in to stop some sort of health or safety threat from occurring and the tenant won't let them in, or using the premises for an unlawful pur purpose, such as maybe a meth lab. Um, but in particular, the threat has to be to the tenants or occupants of the same property, not to other properties. And it's not that the property is a threat to the health and safety of the tenant. So like an uninhabitable property does not result in an ev eviction because the property is a health or safety threat. It's actually the tenant that has to be the threat. And then under the no fault just cause definitions, I mean, for the most part, you know, our, these evictions will be the at fault just cause type. But if you wanted to fit it into a box under no fault just cause, it would only happen if you had a tenant that's a health or safety threat to other tenants or occupants of the property. And there's a government agency saying that the property needs to be vacated or a local ordinance saying that the property needs to be vacated.
So um, the next question is, can a landlord raise the rent right now? The ordinance doesn't restrict the landlord's ability to charge rent or the, or the tenant's obligation to pay rent, but it does restrict the ability to increase the rent. So um, for the dates of June 3rd through July 1, rent increases for properties that are not exempt from the 2019 Tenant Protection Act. That's our AB 1482 Rent Cap and Just Cause uh, Act that went into effect at the beginning of 2020. For properties that are not exempt from that, they may only increase the rent 1.8% between now and July 1. After July 1, we will go to the new CPI um, for non-exempt properties, the limitation on rent increases under the law prior to the ordinance was 5% plus CPI. And so CPI becomes 4.1%. So now after the ordinance is no longer in effect, there is a much higher increase in rent. Prior to that, uh, the increase was only 5% plus 1.8. So it was only 6.8 and now it'll be 9.1. Exempt properties uh, that are still subject to a certain limitation on increases of not um, no more than 10% in a 30-day period. So uh, exempt properties are still somewhat limited by California law that has always been in place. I caution any landlord against rent increases right now. I, I put in red language here that it really you really should avoid it because any kind of rent increase to a tenant who is not current on their rent could be construed as retaliatory. And all of the new laws layer upon layer increase the restrictions against landlords for doing anything that's retaliatory and increase the liability to landlords for doing anything that might be considered retaliatory. So it's very important to avoid that. Uh, and one way to avoid any kind of claim of retaliation is to not increase the rent. So then how will landlords collect the rent? The good news is that uh, this, uh, the California state law allows landlords to proceed to small claims court after August 1 and the cap on small claims judgments is lifted. It, it's unlimited for COVID rental debt. So rental debt that was owed March 1, 2020 through the end of the COVID restrictions will be obtainable in, a, in small claims court, at least the judgment is obtainable and then collecting the judgment is a whole other story. There is some relief for landlords financially. Um, there are federal and state rental assistance programs and those programs come with many strings attached. Uh, first and foremost, I think the, the major difficulty I'm hearing is that landlords and tenants cannot agree to participate. A lot of landlords who want to participate can't get the tenants to agree to participate. I'm sure there are some tenants who whose landlords don't want to participate because in particular, the, the federal program, uh, I'm sorry, the state program that's funded by federal funds requires the landlord to agree to write off 20% of the COVID rental debt in exchange for receiving 80% of the COVID rental debt uh, as compensation. And then the tenant gets to stay. And even for future failure to pay rent, as long as it's considered COVID rental debt and the tenant has the COVID hardship and the tenant qualifies, the, um, the recovery is available through those federal and some state rental assistance programs. And the best way to access those programs would be to go to the housingiskey.com website or call the phone number 833-422-4255 and figure out whether you can qualify for that rental assistance as the landlord. It, you can apply online and then the tenant has to agree to cooperate with the landlord or vice versa. If a landlord fails to cooperate with the tenant who's requesting the rental assistance, the tenant may still obtain 25% compensation, which is supposed to be paid to the landlord. For landlords who are 
unable to pay their mortgage. There are a lot of mortgage forbearance programs right now. Most lenders will agree to forbearance, at least for the time being. And then we have all of the federal programs under the CARES Act that require certain um, lenders to provide forbearance for extended periods of time. And then with regard to collecting rent after the fact, like I said, small claims court has, uh, has this new program where the limitations on the amount, which was $10,000, is now unlimited for recovery of COVID-related rental debt. The federal eviction moratorium is still in effect um, through the rules issued by the Center for Disease Control. However, in January, the, I'm sorry, uh, in, in early May, a federal court judge struck down the CDC eviction moratorium, but the judgment is on appeal. So the CDC eviction moratorium is still valid until the appeal is completed. I didn't, I didn't check to see if there has been any progress on that appeal. So the CDC hardship declaration is still in play. Um, it creates an issue when we take a tenant to court to evict them, they may prove that they are uh, protected by the CDC regulations. And if they do, then we would not be able to proceed with a lockout against them until further notice, until that CDC moratorium is over. And then I mentioned the federal stimulus money that's being used to fund the renters aid program. Uh, there was $1.7 billion issued to the state of California to fund that program. <clears throat> and those funds are intended to, to provide funds to income qualified tenants or their landlords in exchange for an agreement in which the landlord forgives some of the debt. Okay, so virtual trials and jury trials are still moving forward. We've had no indication from the court that the San Diego County ordinance is going to stop them from holding hearings or stop them from processing lawsuits. It is very much the landlord's risk that they are taking if they choose to file anything with the court or go to a hearing or proceed with a trial while the ordinance is happening. Um, but the virtual trials are happening on Microsoft Teams, and those are mostly the bench trials because jury trials have to be in person. As of April of this year, jury trials, civil jury trials are going forward. There have been lots and lots of criminal jury trials, and I believe family court also started long before April. But for civil, they really just started end of March, early April. And that's a game changer for tenant and landlord attorneys because tenant attorneys were using the request for jury trial as a way to postpone a trial in an unlawful detainer indefinitely. Uh, so now that tactic is off the table. And finally, enforcing judgments for possession of premises. Once you get the judgment from the court, you uh, you submit the writ of possession documentation to the court and they issue you your writ of possession. You take that writ of possession to the sheriff's department, you pay the sheriff's fee, and then the sheriff does their procedure. Their procedure is to post a notice to vacate at the property, a five-day notice to the tenant, um, notifying the tenant that the sheriff will come back and perform a lockout if the tenant fails to vacate. And then the sheriff gets to choose when they actually perform the lockout. <clears throat> the difficulty has been ever since last year, end of last year in, in like October, when we started getting judgments for unlawful detainer again, is that the sheriff has discretion as to when they want to perform this lockout. So we had one uh, where the sheriff posted the notice to vacate on February 4th, and then I got a call April 22nd that the sheriff was ready to move forward with the lockout. Um, we have one that I told you we, we went to jury trial, the sheriff posted the notice to vacate and still hasn't been, uh, they still haven't proceeded with it. I'm informed that there is some sort of procedure at the sheriff's department where they run these things up to the supervisor and the supervisor gets to uh, determine whether the tenant is a threat or whether there's good cause to move forward with the lockout 
So it's a little bit uh, uncertain whether even once you go through the whole eviction process, when you're actually going to get possession of the premises if the tenants don't vacate voluntarily. So I wanna leave some time for questions um, and this is some contact information if you need to reach out, if you have a situation that you think we can move forward with. Um, but I am happy to answer some questions. I think we have until about one o'clock to do that. And you can put your questions in the chat, I think. So let's see. Uh, is there a page with a step-by-step -step process to evict a tenant that is destroying property, has too many staying visitors in the property, no permission to stay, um, they are not paying rent for seven months, and twice in the last two months, several officers came over to take care of something at the property. What happens if the person is arrested for a long period of time and the lease expires? So um, with regard to any arrests or police activity at the property, it is quite possible that you might have a health and safety issue. We would have to know more about what, what is going on. You know, if it's domestic violence between individuals at the property, then arguably a, a tenant is a hazard to the health and safety of another occupant of the property. And so, you know, that's the kind of situation that might work, but without knowing more about exactly what's happening. And I don't really want to get give legal advice on particular situations, but you, you see where I'm going with this. Destroying the property is not currently a reason for eviction unless destroying the property affects the health and safety of other occupants. Too many staying in the property. Um, you know, you could probably come up with some kind of argument as to why that's a hazard to health and safety of the other occupants, especially if the other occupants will testify that it is, uh, that maybe you could get somebody out. Not paying rent is uh, if they, we may be able to move forward with those evictions if they have not paid 25% prior to June 30th. And then after July 1, they haven't issued uh, the declaration and they haven't paid the 25%. Those are individuals who are not protected, which I, I'm not sure if I said this, but um, it's interesting that that little carve out seems to be the people who would be the hardest hit by COVID. Uh, the people who could not even afford to pay the 25%. The people who cannot pay 25% of their rent prior to June 30th can be evicted on July 1. And yet those would arguably be the people who are suffering the most, who have the least money to pay their rent. Um, okay, I'll move on. Oh, what happens when a lease expires? Uh, expiration of a fixed term lease is not currently a reason for an eviction. And even but prior to the San Diego County ordinance, expiration of a fixed term lease did not support an eviction alone. You had to offer, the landlord has to offer the tenant a new lease under similar terms. Uh, and then the tenant has to refuse to renew the lease. Many of the landlords who just wanna get the tenant out they don't wanna risk offering a new lease and getting locked in for another year with a tenant that they would rather not be locked in with. Okay, next question. Uh, what is the maximum I can raise my tenant's rent? I'm the, in, of the mindset, it is probably not the correct time to raise rents due to COVID. I agree with that, uh, but do you have any comments on this? So Jeff, the depends on whether the property is exempt or non-exempt from the AB 1482 regulation. That's the 2019 Tenant Protection Act. Um, so we have to know that first and then determine whether the increase in rent is intended to take place between June 3rd to July 1. So for a property that's not exempt, the limitation on the rent increase is only 1.8%. After July 1, then that will increase to 5% plus CPI, which I was, I believe is going to be 4.1% at that point. So you, you could, the, the recommendation is just to wait until 
after July 1 to increase any rents. But even then, if there could be any reason why that tenant feels that the increase in rent is retaliatory, there could be a, an even bigger issue, which is why I'm just recommending stay away from it unless you really need to raise the rent. I would wait until after COVID is over entirely um, so that you can be in the clear. Can an owner serve a month to month paying tenant a notice to vacate? Uh, only if they fall under the requirements of the San Diego County ordinance. Until the ordinance expires, notices to vacate, you've only got two reasons. One is that they have not paid the COVID rental debt, the 25%, two, they, or, or two, if they are a hazard to the health and safety of the te other tenants or occupants of the same property. After the San Diego County ordinance expires, then we have to look at where we are at with the COVID 2020 Tenant Protection Act, whether that's been extended or not. Um, does this apply to short-term rentals? Yes, to the extent that a short-term rental becomes a tenancy. So there is some ambiguity with the term short-term rentals because many people feel that if the term of the rental is very short in comparison to like if it's a few months instead of a year that that's a short-term rental. A short-term rental where an individual is a lodger or a hotel occupant um, is somebody who's there for 28 days or less. And once they surpass the 28 day mark, they become a tenant and they take on all of the rights of a tenant. So there is a procedure for removing lodgers that is a summary procedure, but once they become a tenant, then all of this stuff that I'm talking about applies to them. Next question, my client's buyer's offer has been accepted by the seller. The property is tenant occupied. Can tenants stay longer than the date that they have been notified to vacate the property? Yes, the answer is if they choose to hold over they, they, they can do so, and there's very little you can do to try to remove them. Uh, in fact, under the San Diego County Ordinance, it's actually dangerous to make any suggestion to them that they should, they should leave because they were given notice. Um, SDAR has a form that I believe they have created for realtors to give to their clients to inform the clients about this whole situation um, to make sure that your buyers are not surprised when you close escrow and these tenants are there for another who knows how long. Um, it is a very dangerous situation to, it's important to make sure that your buyers understand that we have this very onerous restriction right now. Next question, you mentioned ejectment. Ejectment, how is a buyer safeguarded in the case of a seller holding over after the agreed upon time after close of escrow? You usually use a seller in possession addendum. Once you close escrow, the seller is no longer an owner. So a ejectment doesn't apply. Ejectment applies when you are trying to remove an owner or an, arguably someone might be an owner um, they might claim an ownership interest to the extent that the unlawful detainer court doesn't want to deal with them. It's a very fragile, fine line between a tenant and an owner if that tenant who's claiming ownership has any support for that claim. And so then if the, if we, some, you know, sometimes we've tried evictions that didn't work out because the tenant was able to muddy the water and provide the court with enough information that the court just you know, said, I, this doesn't look like an unlawful detainer to me, you're gonna have to go do this in civil court. So then we file an ejectment action in civil court and it's a very slow moving action. It doesn't get priority like unlawful detainers. Um, but when you close escrow, the seller is no longer an owner and therefore if they're still in occupancy, they become a tenant. So you, do, you usually would have a seller in possession addendum um, one recommendation that I told, I heard and I totally agree with is if you're going to agree to it, make sure that there is a penalty or a per diem 
that the seller has to pay. You know, you'd want to have a, a pretty high per diem rate that if the seller is going to hold over, at the very least, your buyers would be compensated for what they have to pay to go live someplace else or what they're losing by not being able to take occupancy of the property. Um, next question, can you discuss again the limitation on negotiating with tenants to vacate, such as a cash for keys agreement? Uh, the most conservative interpretation of the San Diego County ordinance is that even the suggestion that you want the tenant to vacate could be a violation. I don't take that extreme of a position, but um, my colleague and my colleague very intelligently indicated that you know these are snakes in the grass for the for the landlords. Um, it's really subjective whether the tenant feels that the landlord has violated the ordinance by asking them if they might agree to a, a date to vacate, because it says that the landlord uh, may not represent to a tenant that the tenant is required to move out of their unit by law. So if you go ahead and you draft an agreement, you say sign this so that you have to leave on that date you agreed to, you are representing that the tenant could be obligated to vacate by law. And so then, you know, is this tenant the kind of person who, or they need an attorney who wants to take advantage of the ordinance and try to get some money from the landlord by filing a lawsuit because they felt that the ordinance was violated? Um, so technically, a cash for keys agreement is not is not um, prevented by the ordinance, and it does expressly state that it does not get in the way of any relocation assistance between the landlord or the tenant. Uh, nothing in this section shall be construed to supersede any applicable requirements in the civil code pertaining to relocation assistance or rent waiver. You know, it doesn't preclude relocation assistance, but even negotiating a move out could be a problem. So next question, for notices that shall be deemed invalid and insufficient, does this make them void so we would have to refile? Or can we put the notices on hold and submit to the court once the ordinance expires? The ordinance expressly states that they are invalid. Um, I could read this to you if I can find it. It, it, it expressly states that the notices that don't comply are deemed invalid, but I am not finding the exact statement here at the moment. It's in there though, I promise. Ah, here it is. It's um, section 3C, number four. Any notice of termination of tenancy served or expiring during the local emergency, that's the local emergency that started February 14, 2020, or within 60 days afterward, which means that once the local emergency is lifted, within 60 days after that, shall be deemed invalid and insufficient to support an action in unlawful detainer during the local emergency or at any time afterward. This means that even if you've already filed your unlawful detainer with a notice that's not compliant, your unlawful detainer is now invalid because the notices that you use do not support it any longer. Is that constitutional? I don't know. That's up for interpretation by the court or jury. Um, okay, so. Rent increase limitation ordinance as for existing tenants or a tenant, new tenant renting a vacant apartment. Oh, that's a good question. So if you have a new tenancy, you are not limited to the increase. Um, I had this discussion with a client who was concerned about the local states of emergency because there is another statute, it's penal code 396, that um, prevents a landlord from increasing rent as advertised. So if you advertise it and then you increase it during uh, a certain period of time after a local emergency has been declared. 
But according to the calculations by the, um, I think it was the American Apartment Owners Association in California, there we're beyond most, uh, we're beyond those time frames. So that penal code statute, I don't think is in effect right now, but there is a limitation on increasing by a certain amount during a local state of emergency, even if it's a new tenancy. Let's put that aside though, because I think that the right answer to the question is that at this time, if you have a new tenant coming in, um, you are free to increase the rent as much as you, as much as is appropriate for that, for that apartment. Um, the penal code is specifically relating to uh, prevention of rent gouging during states of emergency. And it is very specific in its application and very narrow in its application. Uh, how many days can the notice be if a tenant is threatening health or safety? Is it a three day? Yeah, we assume that most of these situations that would fall under the hazard to the health and safety would be a nuisance situation or waste and or illegal activity. And so under the nuisance provision of Civil Code 1161, it would just have to be a three day notice. You don't have to do the 15 day for those. What if the landlord needs to move into the property or sells the property? Those evictions, those are the ones that we've been able to proceed with. Um, not now though. So before the ordinance, San Diego County ordinance, and this is one of the other justifications. It, it, they say, and I was told if you attended the hearings, that one of the justifications that was presented was that there are a bunch of evictions that have been able to move forward since COVID started and that that's not appropriate. Um, the ones that, if depending on what side of this you're on, we're taking advantage of the, the law or finding loopholes in the law are, they, certain people say the ones that were you know, landlords intending to move into the property or landlords who are selling to a buyer who's going to move into the property. With the San Diego County ordinance, they have taken those off the table intentionally. They do not want anyone to proceed with those kinds of evictions right now. Um, yeah. Where can we get the SDAR form you mentioned? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure if it's in the library. I mean, I assume it'll be in the risk management library for um, in your zip forms once it's out. I, I think it might be out. Maybe Ryan or, or Carla could speak to that. Please feel free to jump in if you know. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep moving and maybe we'll come back to that. Uh, okay, so Riverside County, not San Diego County. Tenant is not in arrears and has never been and no claim or declaration of hardship. So just a good normal paying tenant. Property is confirmed, exempt under 1482. Landlord has sent RCJC notice of exemption, check marked via mail and sent a follow-up by email with the attached with it attached. Tenant has verbally confirmed receipt, rent cap just, oh, RCJC rent cap just cause um, addendum, I guess, to the landlord, but has not yet returned it and signed it. Can the landlord serve notice of termination of tenancy at this time, now that the RCJC has been provided and the property is exempt? Again, this is not SD County. Um, I, I want to refrain from giving express legal advice on specific situations. Um, I, I would say that it, in order to claim the exemption, the notice had to, there, there had to have either been two things, either a notice served prior to August 1, 2020. So if that notice was not served prior to August 1, 2020, the only way to claim the exemption uh, is to include it in the lease. So serving an addendum to the lease that the tenant signs would be a valid way to claim the exemption today. If the tenant doesn't sign it, that means they have not, um, they have not agreed to the change in their lease. 
So the alternative would be to serve them with a lease. I, I mean, once their lease expires, give them a new lease that contains the exemption language and, and then they have to sign it. If they're not signing it, then it becomes very difficult to claim the exemption. Serving a notice on the tenant now, stating that the property is exempt, that is something we've been doing for clients. But arguably, if you're in court and the tenant uses that as a defense, it's really up to a, a judge or a jury to interpret whether or not the property is exempt. Uh, so it becomes a question of fact as to whether or not the property is exempt, whether or not the tenant has complied. So that's a, a bit of a tough one. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Uh, what is a realistic backlog of evictions currently in the pipeline with the court system? We haven't noticed too much of a backlog with the court. The court has done an excellent job of moving the evictions through, um, being able to stay on top of them. It, it, we have not noticed delays with the court. There's a statute that requires the trial to be set within 20 days of the plaintiff's request to set the case for trial. And they have been, for bench trials, they have been complying with that. For jury trials, um, I think that's more difficult. But um, anyway, I, I don't see much of a backlog. The backlog is more at the sheriff's department where they have the writ and they're just not performing the lockouts. Um, lease expires, next question is lease expires August 31. Can we not renew it and have them move out? Do we have to give notice that we aren't renewing it? Can we say we need to sell it or move a parent in there at the end of the lease? Um, prior to the San Diego ordinance, we could work with that scenario. But now with the San Diego ordinance, those kind of evictions are off the table for the time being. You know, like I said, the, the ordinance is short lived. Hopefully it's done by sometime in August um, with any luck. And then we'll be able to go back to those kinds of evictions and um, see if we can, you know, fit the pieces together to be successful. I always like to say we, we set up every eviction to be successful. It's not a question of whether you'll be able to get the tenant out. It's a question of how long is it gonna take and how much is it gonna cost? So, you know, we'll work with it, but with the, with the current ordinance, we're really not planning to do many evictions at all or serve really any notices at all, except for those very narrow circumstances until the ordinance expires. Once the ban is lifted and 60 days passes, what are reasons you can use to get the tenant out. We would go back to the 2020 COVID Protection Act. Um, I have some slides that, you know, I, I have all of those ones that we can move forward with. It's everything other than the, um, the rental debt, uh, other, well, there are different kinds of COVID rental debt. So, but for the most part, we were not doing uh, non-payment of rent evictions, and we were not doing evictions based on subleasing, but we were doing a lot of the evictions, uh, we're, we're trying to do a lot of the evictions for um, people who need to move into their properties or need to move their family into their properties, or they're in escrow for sale to a bona fide purchaser at fair market value, and the purchaser is going to move into the property. Expiration of a fixed term lease, as I mentioned before, it's not alone a valid reason for an eviction, you have to offer a new lease and then the tenant has to reject it. We've got a lot of questions and I'm not sure if I should keep going since we were supposed to end at one. Um, I think I have a direct message. Okay, I don't know. I'll, I'll just keep going until someone stops me. Yes, please continue to do so if you don't mind. Okay, sure. I can I can probably go until 1.30. I think I have a 1.30, uh, but I don't have my phone on me to check my calendar. So let's just say I'll go to 1.30 if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Ryan, do you know about that risk management form if that's out? I typed into the chat. It, um, it is still under development right now. And then once it's available, we'll be noticing everybody. 
And okay, then I also thanks. included the email address for our vice president of risk management. It is coming from uh, through that department um, and that committee. Uh, so they'll, she'll be able to provide any updates for anybody that's interested. Great. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Um, so I mentioned section four of the ordinance saying all of the UD notices are invalid for the time frame up until 60 days after it's lifted. So does that mean once the time is up, we can continue to evict with the prior UD judgment? It depends on your interpretation. So is it a notice or is it a judgment? So you're, you're talking about different things here. A 60 day notice that is served prior to or expires during the ordinance is invalid. You have to start all over once the ordinance expires. You have to start, you have to do new notices after the ordinance expires because of the way it's worded. Even the judgments, someone who would, you know, interpret this very conservatively, even judgments that were entered based on notices that are invalid under the ordinance could be invalid. And so depending on where you are in that process, it becomes very confusing. Like, I don't even know if I can go to court to attend a hearing. Um, presumably I could go attend a hearing because I have to as an officer of the court, but I could only go for the reason of telling the court that we are taking this hearing off calendar and staying the case until the ordinance is expired. So um, the, the other question is, is it constitutional to have this ordinance go back retroactively that far? I'm very hopeful that the Southern California Housing Rental Housing Association's lawsuit is successful because you look at this uh, from an attorney's perspective as the basis for a lot of litigation against people who have done things before today, not knowing that this was gonna happen and creating all this liability that we, you know, there's um, due process, you know, you're entitled to notice of the law before you can actually violate it. Uh, so I suspect that that the way that it's drafted will be invalidated, but I, I don't know. What are examples of health and safety nuisance issues? Um, good question. Health and safety nuisance issues would include like a meth lab, um, but again, qualify that by it has to be a threat to occupants of the same property. A meth lab, certainly in, a, in an apartment building, would threaten the health and safety of other occupants of that property. But a meth lab in a single family residence where there, there's only one person living there might not. Um, other health and safety threats, like, we, you know, there's an example that came up if the tenants are now having dis domestic disputes where one of them is attacking the other, um, at least one of those tenants could, could be evicted. Although the other one, the victim would be protected from eviction under another law that prevents us from evicting someone who's become the victim of domestic violence. Um, it's really hard to come up with ones. And they, they carve out an exception for people who have COVID, you know, who arguably could get other people at the property sick. You, you can't use COVID as a health and safety reason. Um, I, there was back, you know, taking you back to the summer of 2020, where we had the public health and safety exception in order to try to move forward with evictions. <laughs> One attorney I know was able to proceed because they had another tenant who was throwing water on on the tenants at the property, you know, they were running around throwing water on other tenants and they were able to get a health and safety exception for that. Uh, so we just have to take it on a case by case basis. Okay, what is the total legal fee for eviction through my firm I, I don't want to quote fees. Um, you know, we, we do a flat fee for the first portion of residential evictions, but then um, cases that go to trial are much more expensive because of the time that we have to put in so that, you know, there's, there's a flat fee for the first part and it's limited. And then depending on what happens, then there are some hourly fees, um, but feel free to contact the firm. You can either look up my name, Shanna Welsh Levin, 
or SoCal Realty Law is probably easier to remember, SoCal Realty Law. And, uh, and then we can send you a, a fee schedule relating to that. What if upon the close of escrow, the seller simply refuses to move out, uh, though the RPA says they will, and there's no lease back after sale in place? Um, you know, that's a tough one. Uh, it's nice when you have the seller in possession addendum, but when you don't, the seller becomes a tenant. They are in breach of contract. And to the extent that the buyer would have out of pocket damages to, you know, to have to live someplace else um, or other kinds of losses, they would be able to claim those under breach of contract. And so, um, you know, you, you can't evict them right away, at least not yet the purchase agreement could support an eviction of the seller because it's if it states that they'll move out prior to close of escrow you know you, you check that box the property will be delivered vacant then you can use that instead of having to give notice you don't have to give any new notice to the seller um, under normal circumstances but today in san diego county you've got to wait until the ordinance is uh, is over. And one of, by the way, one of the bases for eviction prior to the ordinance is if the tenant or the occupant provided in writing their agreement to move out. So if your tenant says, I'm going to move out, you send you an email, I'm going to move out on April 25th, and then they don't move out, you can use that email instead of having to do a notice you could use that representation as the basis for the eviction. And uh, you can't do that during the ordinance, but when the ordinance expires, then you could use any kind of representation that, they, that the occupant agreed to move out on a certain date, as long as the representation isn't ambiguous. Um, okay. Uh, if we want to offer a lease renewal during this period, can we increase the rent? Uh, from, from June 3rd to July 1, it depends. Okay, so Tracy, it depends on whether the um, property is exempt or not exempt. You can increase the rent on, on either an exempt or not exempt property. Legally, you can do it, but there are limitations on the amounts. So for a non-exempt property from June 3rd to July 1, it's 1.8% 1 is the, the cap. But after July 1, then you're just subject to the AB 1482 limitation, which is 5% plus CPI. If it's an exempt property, then you are um, only limited by the statewide 10% uh, cap in any 30-day period. Can we share the information again? Oh, yeah, I can share share the screen if you would like to see the contact information. And then uh, I think this is probably the last question. If listing agent must provide to the buyer or buyer's agent notice of lease cancellation given to the tenant, so the buyer is aware about all time frames when the tenant must move out from the subject property. So I think the question is whether the listing agent has to provide to the buyer or the buyer's agent any notice of lease cancellation. So the buyer is aware about all the time frames when the tenant must move out from the subject property. I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think it is a material disclosure to make sure the buyer is aware that notice has been given or, and that there is some kind of time frame. But I also think that SDAR is smart to provide uh, something that would also inform buyers that this is a very uncertain time and we really don't know how evictions will be able to proceed or whether they'll be able to proceed if you buy this property with a tenant in place. So, you know, at least giving the buyer the choice to not buy it. If they really need to move in someplace, then they better 
try to find someplace else that is vacant that they know for sure they'll be able to occupy right away. Happy to assist. Thanks everyone.